almost invariably they try and get away. So Nick's experience is a typical experience of coming across a leopard at short distance. All you see is a blur of spots and colour. Gone. I think they're firmly established in the food chain. They're obviously breeding. I was 12 when I first saw uh, the Black Panther, and those cats are still reported in the same area now. They're here to stay. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of Big Cat Conversations. For this edition, we'll be hearing about an incident that occurred on the eastern side of England in early spring last year, so 2023. And that was about a year ago from the date of this recording, which we're doing in March 2024. The witness, Eliza, is a young girl who was out with her cub pack one evening. After the event, she discussed what she'd seen with her family and we will hear directly from Eliza and then her mum, Sarah, in what follows. Obviously, it's very interesting to hear from a young person on the podcast, and Eliza and I start off talking about our respective domestic black cats and how they behave, because I have Zaki, a little black cat, as I've mentioned before, and Eliza and Sarah have three domestic black cats we're about to hear about. So Eliza is going to take the lead first in the conversation with me, and then her mum, Sarah, will take the lead a bit later, and they may both chip in as we go. Right, should we get talking about our black cats then? Yeah. Yeah, so I've got Zaki, the stray cat who's moved in, and I'll tell you something new that happened to him last week. But first of all, can we hear about your black cats? You've got three. Do they get on all right? Well, um, Peggy and Dolly, the two oldest cats, we got them a long time ago. They're about seven or eight now. But the youngest, Dennis... We got him in lockdown, and he's, I think, three. And Dennis is usually what the one who starts the fights. But when he was a kitten, he was just a lovely, nice kitten. So we think that Peggy probably taught him how to fight. Dolly was usually, before Dennis came, she was sort of the queen of the house. She would boss everybody around, meow a lot to get food or the things she wanted. Actually, right now... We think that he's probably caught a mouse because he's been watching under our sofa quite a lot and just staying there all day watching. They release them, don't they, to play with them a bit more? Yeah. I mean, we put a bell on Zaki. I mean, luckily, Zaki doesn't... I would hate it if Zaki got a lot of birds, but luckily yeah. he mainly goes for mice and rats and uh, sometimes gets squirrels and rabbits, which is what he's obviously been used to doing as a stray cat to feed himself. We have this thing on the podcast called Word of the Week or Words of the Week, and I was asking on email you and your mum what you might suggest. And you've come up with Tail Talk, which is a great idea because of the podcast which talks about cats of all sizes, especially big ones. We've never talked about ta the tail language much, really. So tell us mm -hmm. about what you see in the tail language and the, the way your cats use their tails. Well, um, especially with Peggy and Dennis... We sometimes get like old bits of clothes or like gloves or things and then sort of move, move our hands around to get them energetic. And when they're watching the toy, Dennis especially, his tail starts flicking around. He goes very low to the ground with his ears all back. When he's really cross, he really starts flicking his tail. But when he's happy and calm, it's usually just up in the air when he's coming in for food especially. And in a way, that's the link to big cats because one of the things they do in their habitat is they signal to the prey and to the rest of the ecosystem that they're not in hunting mode or stalking mode by lifting their tail up mm. and going through without any hunting vibes. And it just means everybody can calm down and you know, we don't need to sort of get in all in a commotion or a panic or concentrate and use up energy. So it's interesting yeah. that big cats do that kind of thing as well. Yeah, they're very similar in lots of, different, lots of ways. Yeah, and uh, just quickly, one thing. Last week it was, actually, we had a, another stray cat turned up. It looks like a stray cat on my cameras and from when I view it. 
And for two days, Zaki was really nervous and on edge. And in fact, he did have a fight. He did go to the vets. And I was hoping the other cat didn't get injured, but Zaki got injured. And I think he lost the fight, as it were, because for the next two Mm. days, he was super nervous and super cautious. Luckily, this cat seems to have gone. I'm not anti other cats, but I just don't want them to fight and uh, don't want them to get injured. I don't want Zaki to get injured and big vet spills and that sort of thing. So uh, our Duke the dog, our dog actually chased it and I let him chase it knowing that he wouldn't hurt it because he doesn't hurt cats. If he catches up with them or if he catches up with squirrels, he just sort of barks and uh, lets them get away at the last second, as it were. So I thought it might be best if this cat keeps away from us and Zaki and knows there's a dog that could chase it. So hopefully Duke has um, kept the peace in that way. But I noticed that Zaki was looking around with his tail swishing, not quite flicking fast as they do if they're about to go for a mouse or something. He was concentrating and looking around and his tail was swishing, a bit like a, a windscreen wiper, you know, going at that constant sort of side to side. He's settled down now, I think. He's recovered from his injuries. And now talking about the big ones, we're going to obviously go on to to your sighting in a second. But before it happened, did you know that there was but the possibility of big, very big, you know, Black Panther type cats in the countryside? Did you know anything about that before your event happened? No, no, we, we didn't really think that, that, that there could be something like that. Just around us when we're going to lots of different places we just had no idea i mean we'd see them in the zoos but never just in the wild so you hadn't read about it in the local newspaper or seen heard about it on tv no. or anything no and it happened when you were in your um cub group and cubs is for eight to ten and a half year old children yeah girls and boys yeah yeah yeah, and, and it's beavers before that. I mean, we have a lot of people overseas listening to the podcast, so just so they know, these are kids' activity groups, and it goes from squirrels from four to six years, beavers, children six to eight years, cubs, eight to ten and a half years, then scouts, ten and a half to fourteen years, and then explorer scouts. Were you yeah. in beavers before, cubs? No, I wasn't in beavers before Cubs, but my sister Anna, she had joined um, about a year before me and she was in Scouts. So I got in especially quick and lots of my friends who were at school started talking about it and were interested in it. So I decided I wanted to try it out. And what sort of things, what activities have you been doing? There's a lot of interacting, like playing games, but occasionally we did stuff like toasting marshmallows. Every week we would do the, the special cub call where we would put three fingers up and say a piece and with all the cub. The marshmallows was round a fire pit or a bonfire, was it, to sit round and talk? Yeah, we got, we got to make them ourselves. Yeah, so it's different outdoor activities, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots of different activities. The big cat incident happened in a local, what we call, country park. For people who live in yeah. uh, overseas in Britain, country parks are not like parks in towns with lots of small grassed areas and flowers. They're more bigger ones on the edge of towns where people can walk dogs and there's lakes, and woodland walkways and big green spaces for activities. So it was a big country park on the edge of, a, of your town. Yeah. So take us through what happened. You were doing an activity. You all had head torches on at this time, did you? Yeah. It was quite dark. It was around six or seven o'clock. So we were advised to bring head torches. And we had sort of split into two groups with a couple of leaders with each. um, So we could explore the area more. We were sort of playing a game, messing around, chatting. And we were at the front of the group. As we were walking towards a bend at the bushes, we were chatting and playing. And then we looked forwards. And we just saw the cat standing where the Ben was, just staring right at us with his big eyes, big yellow eyes. But at that time, we couldn't see the tail. But then later on, we did get to. Did you see the eyes reflecting in the torchlight? Yeah, it was really easy to see the way it was sort of glaring at us. It was really, really close. 
we could see it really clearly. We tried to work it out in the garden. It was about maybe 20 metres. Gosh, that is close, isn't it? Did you think it was a cat straight away? What did you think when you first saw it? What animal type of animal did you think it was? At the time, I, I was really shocked by what I was seeing. But I, I just sort of have an idea that it, because having three cats at home, I realised it looked quite a lot like them, um, like big muscular body, but much, much bigger. So I thought it would be something like that. But I, I wasn't quite sure because it was in the dark. But now I've thought through it, I've realised that's what it could be. What sort of stood out? What can you remember most? What was the sort of most striking aspect of it that you remember? I think the most striking aspect of it was definitely the eyes, because it was quite dark. Even though we had the head torches, we couldn't see much around us. So just having that big yellow orange eyes looking right at us, that was probably the most the thing that stood out the most for me and the size of ears and the, just the size of it compared to domestic cats they have at home and compared to a labrador dog we often ask this on the podcast how big was it compared to a labrador dog i would say it was similar in size but a much more muscular and uh, like it looked um scary with its big teeth and big ears the ears were quite rounded and like the cats we have the big pointy ears they were sort of rounded at the edges like teddy yeah. bear ears sort of okay some people do say that that's interesting yeah and was it side on or facing you or a bit of both did it move much as you saw it it didn't really move much but as it was a bend at first we could only really see the front of it and it was just glaring straight at us facing us and staring right at us. It wasn't really moving much until it, it ran off. And you said you saw the tail later. Can you describe that? As it ran off, which I think was probably most likely to be the big bright light from the head torches of the group that were coming closer to us. And I think that's probably what scared it off. But as it turned around, me and my friends were sort of just looking at each other, quite like, what have we just seen? So um, it, it was quite quick that we saw the tail, but as it was running off, it was sort of just straight out. It didn't look like it, it was going to do anything to us at that moment, but we, we were just shocked by what we had seen. How would you describe the tail when you got a good view of it? It wasn't moving too much. Like the cats at home, it wasn't flicking or it didn't seem particularly happy, but it was sort of just quite monotone, straight out. Compared to the smaller cats we have, it was long and thick, especially at the ends. It didn't sort of curve and smaller. It just stayed thick and big the whole way. Very interesting. And in terms of its behaviour, do you think you stumbled upon it? Do you think it was there sniffing around bins or looking for rabbits? or Do you think it was doing something anyway and you just coincidentally stumbled upon it? Why do you think it was there? I think it was probably, like you said, most likely just going through what it was doing and, and then sort of stumbled upon us. But it might have been drawn to the, the noise we were making being very loud and the big lights. I had torches. I yeah. think it was quite curious. At first, when it was just me and my friends, just a, a small group of three, it was probably quite relaxed. But then as the larger group of about 15 came up, it sort of realised that there was much more of us in the group. Yes, it felt unsettled. Yeah. It didn't really seem like it was in a particular rush, but it was probably quite startled and just, like, went, just started running or scampering off into the bushes. Did it feel like it knew that area and it was on its rounds? It looked like it knew where it was, did it? Yeah. It didn't look lost or... Scared at all. It quite confident. Yeah. At the time, did you say anything to each other or did you just watch in amazement? What happened between the two or three of you watching it? Yeah, we were just quite amazed and just shocked at the same time. We were sort of just nudging each other, looking at each other like, wow, what is this we're seeing? When you realised it was a large cat, did you think 
gosh, is that escape from a zoo? Or did you have any thoughts like that in your mind about how on earth did that get there? Mm -hmm, Yeah, I was just so shocked that there was something so big, like a massive cat that was just in that area where there was young families and children coming there. And it's not far away from houses, is it, as well? I know that some bits of it are quite wild and have got marshes and lakes at part of that country park, but it's not far from houses, is it, as well? No, like, um, when we got to the edge especially, we could clearly see how close it was to the town. Yeah. So what happened then? What was the conversation like between you and your friends who'd seen it? Afterwards, when we started coming to our senses and thinking about what we'd seen, We were all really shocked, like, what was that big cat-like muscular animal staring right at us? It was just amazing. And afterwards, we thought that we should probably tell our leader and the people who were looking after us. And at first, when we told them, they didn't believe us. They said, oh, it must have been a shadow or a tree. So that was quite shocking to us, that they wouldn't really think that we could have seen something that amazing. How many of you saw it close up with you? Was it one or two other people? There was two other people with me, and the group behind us didn't get close enough to see the cat before it ran off. It was just us three that, that saw it. It was clear to us there wasn't a dog or a leash dog that had come off a lead or, or something similar to that. It was clear that it was a massive wild animal by the time of its size and how massive it was, really. And what kind of emotions did you have at the time and afterwards? You know, was it a mix of emotions or one strong type of emotion? I suppose it was quite a mix of emotions. We were curious, amazed, and really quite terrified and shocked about what that massive cat was doing. Afterwards, when we were sort of talking about it, when we got back from the trip, we were just like, wow, what's going to happen after we saw that? Who should we tell? That we would just think lots of different things were going through our minds. Did you worry that you wouldn't be believed by people? Yeah. When I came back and when I'd gone to school and things, I've told my friends about what I've seen, and most of them didn't really particularly believe me and thought it must have been a big dog or or another type of animal, which was quite disappointing in a way. But I, su- I suppose I get that they wouldn't really think like like me before I saw it, that there could be something like that just in the wild. I think that's the thing to think, that it's actually not surprising that people don't believe it if they've never read about it or heard about it. Yeah. Until you start reading about it and think, oh, well, you know, they were dumped pets and uh, they can live here. Did your cub leaders change their view or did they stick with the view that you made a mistake in in seeing something like that? They just stuck with the aspect that we would have mistaken it for something, not being a large cat. Surprisingly, after we told them, after we saw it, they then directed us into the direction we'd seen it. But luckily we didn't encounter it again. Presumably you felt safer, though, in numbers, didn't you, than enough of you? Yeah. After we saw it, we sort of started staying a lot closer to the group and like being more aware of, about what was there, what we had seen. Did you um, think that even if you told your parents, they might not believe you? Well, when I got back, the, the first thing I said to my parents were, I saw this amazing cat, large, muscular cat creature staring right at us. And at first they did believe me, but they were shocked that, I just could have seen that just on a cub walk in a local park. Do you think it helped that there were two others with you? You weren't just on your own. There were two others to back up what you were saying. Did that make you more confident in telling people? Yeah, it did make me feel more confident. Like there was people who had also seen what I had seen, so they could sort of tell others. But yes, we did see this massive creature in the wild. Did it make you curious about what it was? Did you try and look it up on the internet or in books or try and look up Black Panthers and that sort of thing? Yeah, when we got back, we sort of started searching, looking up on the internet about what we saw, if any others had seen it, and if it was what I thought it was. 
and we looked at pictures of the cat I described, a big black muscular cat with large yellow eyes and a thick tail. We did look that up and think, like, wow, this is a panther or a leopard or something, or something amazing like that. Was that helpful to reassure you, to confirm that, that it could have been a, a black leopard or a black panther? Yeah, it, it was helpful to confirm, like, that was what I saw, and I, I wasn't sort of thinking it was something else. And have you seen any of the Jungle Book films, the cartoon or the more recent films with Bargera, the Black Panther, in? Yeah, I have. And would you say it was like Bargera? Yeah, I would say <laughs> it was similar to the Jungle Book animals, but it was much more surprising for me that it was in Britain and in an area where it wasn't really expected to be. And how has it affected you? Does it make you more on edge when you go for walks or does it make you more alert? Does it make you more observant? Or, you know, is there any way that it's going to live on and influence and affect you, do you think? Yeah, when we go out to different places, on walks or things like that, we are more aware, more wary that, that there's something there. Like you said, more observant, that there could be a big cat living in that area, potentially. Does that bother you that you've got to be on the on the alert for big predator type animal, or do you think it's interesting and it's good to be aware of nature and your outdoors, or is it a mix of all of that or what? I think it's good that now I know what is out there and it's not just cute bunny rabbits or things like that, <laughs> and that, that there is dangerous animals there in the wild where we live. How do you feel about the animal? Are you happy for it to stay in the wild with other ones or do you think we've got to be careful in Britain, the fact that these animals are out there? Or have you got any feelings about that? I think that, that it's really dangerous, for, especially for in areas where there's lots of houses, like the park that I saw it in, and where there's, there's lots of other families and children going there. I think it's, it's a really dangerous thing that, that there's animals like that. What about the fact that hardly anybody's seen it and it hasn't caused any problems as far as we know, do you think? Is that good news so far? I think, in a way, it's good that not too many people have, have encountered it in that dangerous area. But I suppose, in a way, it was sort of amazing that, that I could have seen that just on a daily basis. So you think it's dangerous because it was so close to town and lots of other people, but what about if it was well away into the countryside with huge forests and, and fields and not many people living close? Does that make it a bit more acceptable, do you think? Yeah, I think it, it's quite amazing that there's these wonderful creatures living. I think I have mixed emotions by what I've seen and... I think it's much better if they're in a wider area with plants and places where there's less people and houses, like towns. In a way, it's crazy that, that they're living in the wild. And it's like when, when you're going out, out on a walk or a trip, that they could just be watching you or near you. Really interesting to have all these thoughts from you. I know it's tricky. And just one more thing before we hand it over to Sarah, your mum. Do you sometimes keep it a secret from people? Do you sometimes think it's going to be a bit awkward to talk about? And I'll give you an example. My son, Owen, who now helps edit and produce these podcasts because he's a sound specialist, when he was at school, he was very interested in the subject, but he would never tell his friends and his mates about his dad's interest in big cats and his own interest in big cats because of me because he just felt it was a bit too awkward and he you know and some people wouldn't believe it and some people would be scared so he just kept quiet about it do you keep quiet about it largely or are you happy to talk to some of your friends about it or do you make a decision about who you talk to about it well after i saw it i was really surprised and i immediately thought Oh, I should tell my friends about what I've seen. Most of them didn't really believe me. They didn't really think that I could have seen something like that. It must be a misunderstanding. So, yeah, I, th I think sometimes it can be a bit awkward talking when people don't really... Talking about um, the subject where but people don't really believe what you're saying. Does that make you keep more quiet about it, perhaps? 
Yeah, I suppose a, a little, yeah. I mean, has it given you lessons in life? Because not everything in life, when we're adults, is easy to talk about. You've got to make the judgments about whether you start a conversation about something, if people are going to disagree mm-hmm. or not believe you. So do you think mm-hmm. it's going to help you later in life make decisions and choices about whether to bring something up in a conversation or whatever? Yeah, I think um, if people are interested in that subject or they want to know about it, I mean, I'm going to tell them about what I saw, but just bringing it up randomly, I, I don't think that that would be it. Yeah, I think that's what Owen did. That's exactly what Owen did. And I think, you know, there's, there's plenty of other subjects you have to do the same with, basically, in life. Well, thank you ever so much, Eliza. We'll talk to you again in a minute. Listeners may be wondering how old you are. You're 10 now, is that right? Yeah. So you were nine when this happened? Yeah, I was around nine years old. Good stuff. Well, we'll get you back to the microphone just before we finish in a minute. We'll have a final chat, but for now we'll have Mum's take on it. So we thank you, Eliza, now, and, we'll, and we welcome Sarah. Sarah, thanks ever so much for joining us and for helping arrange this with Eliza and how clear she was, and you must be very proud of her, and it's so good that we've heard from her on the podcast. So can we have your perspective? When Eliza started mentioning it to you, how are you feeling? Hi, Rick. Lovely to talk to you, and thanks for listening to Eliza's story. I just heard her saying at the end there, talking about mixed emotions, and I think that goes for me too. Looking back, I sort of feel slightly odd about we didn't really know how to take it. And I think lives are very busy, aren't they? And it takes a while for things to sink in sometimes. And I think also it's really hard to explain, but you have no context for things like this. And so if your daughter comes back from a kind of, you know, a supposedly safe and sort of chaperoned exciting walk with a cub troop with plenty of adults and professionals and leaders and volunteers and says oh I think I saw a massive cat mummy and you sort of you know say oh what like Dennis or whatever no mummy it was as tall as me right okay and you know and it, actually it's bedtime and you've got to get dinner and you just sort of slowly process it so I think I don't have an easy response to what do I think or kind of what's my emotion about it it just kind of gradually sunk in and actually the process over the last few sort of weeks and days of thinking about talking to you has actually listening to Eliza's story a bit more has been quite an emotional thing because I think, you know, as she's explained, things like how near it was. And I didn't have that hadn't really sunk in before. You were kind of pacing it out. And at first she said what the distance she was telling me was about 10 metres. I said, it can't have been 10 metres away. Just standing there watching you, she said, maybe a bit more. So we sort of, you know, so I said, all right, maybe 10 to 20. But I mean, this is really right in front of you. And then there's a lot involved for when she tells her responsible adult. And I mean, absolutely no disrespect to cub leaders who, you know, people like that who volunteer for such roles make the world go round. But I think to be told, don't be silly, it's a tree and to walk exactly where it just went. It takes a little bit of processing, I think. Of course, it is difficult, isn't it? I mean, putting ourselves in the shoes of the responsible adult and you've got no context, and no background. Mm hmm. And you've got to make instant judgments because you've got a whole group of kids to go through the activities. It's one of those things where I think people can't win. If you were sort of sitting at a desk and you're trying to reflect on it the next day and you were told, you might think, oh, well, we'll, we'll just in case that child is correct, we can reorganise the direction of the activity or whatever. But there on the spot, I guess it is a bit more difficult. Not that I'm making excuses. Did it influence you, the fact that it wasn't just her, it was two friends as well that had a consistent, they backed each other up? Did that help at all? It just kind of broadened the context of it all and it kind of completed the story, I suppose. I mean, Eliza is a quite an articulate and truthful child. She's not told her anything untruthful to me that I'm aware of and she takes things quite seriously. Um, and I think when she sort of says something completely out of the blue, as I said, with no context and nothing to prove or anything to gain, I think there's no reason not to think, right, okay, so what you do is you talk to her about it, you try and understand it, and you think, well, could it have been this and could it have been that? And let's have a look on the internet. And I think the the picture we came to, I can't remember which site it was, but, you know, just kind of a, a Google Images search of this kind of black cat standing up, just surrounded by greenery, looking towards the, the camera. She's like, yep, that was it. I was like, right, okay. <laughs> you know, and that's, and and then, of course, the next thing is, well, what do you do about it? And you think, again, that I, I have no framework for that as a mum who's kind of freaked out. 
and someone who doesn't really know where to go with it. So there's people you can tell. And I think within the space of a few kind of weeks or months, I did tell the leader of the Cub Pack. I did make a kind of online report to the local police force. And I did contact the management company of the country park. None of those resulted in anything really at all. And then I think eventually we sort of stumbled across your details online as we looked into it a bit more. And you're the only person who's responded. So thanks very much for listening. <laughs> well, it's good to talk it through, and which is what we're doing, isn't it? Yeah. We are a community learning together at it. The more people who can come forward and talk about these challenges, the better, I think. And at least you have reported it to the local police and the country park managers. Because if they get another one, say it was the first time, and they genuinely weren't aware of it, well, if they get mm. two or three more in the next year, then they might think, hang on, there's something maybe going on here. It's not just a sort of one person making a mistake. I think awareness raising helps, and it's best to own up if you can, without sort of making a huge fuss and a huge commotion and going over the top. And presumably you just reported it as it happened. You weren't asking for any action to be taken, like the place to be closed or anything. It was just reporting it for information, were you? Yeah, it was just the kind of you perhaps should be aware that X and Y happened. It perhaps didn't land with enormous impact, perhaps because it was a, a nine-year-old who'd seen it rather than you know a, a large rambling group of adults or something. But like you say, we don't know if that's the first ever such report or if they're sitting on 200. And, and I guess if it's the latter, then... Really, there should be a framework to do something around that. And I think, you know, as I kind of still now reflect on, on what happened, what should happen? Well, I don't know. But I think if a cub leader or a local scout troop or a, you know, some sort of you know, outdoor activity, with, especially with, with small children, is going to use these amazing outdoor spaces, there should be a framework to prepare for that in a sensible and informed way. And I don't quite know how that isn't scaremongering, but is just sensible. As I thought it through earlier today, I was thinking, well, so when the, the scout troop, the older children move on to, they do a trip to Canada, for example, where they go to somewhere where bears are known and they do specific training on what to do. If you encounter a bear, they carry the spray, they, you know, they kind of run through various drills. I mean, I guess that is a kind of sensible preparing and informational sort of process to go through might be a good sort of template for it. You know, I don't know. I don't know if there is a a space in our country and in our consciousness to move to a place where if we're going rambling in the dusk with small children, we think, ah, oh, these are some of the things we need to prepare for. That might seem sensible, I suppose. I suppose the issue is how we get from nowhere, you know, from, from virtually no awareness to, mm. to sort of complete awareness and that transition. And that's a whole thing to manage, isn't it? To make sure it's all in proportion and people don't go over the top mm -hmm. and get over worried and whatever. As an example, actually, this was over 10 years ago. I bumped into a guy in the village here and he said, oh, you're the chap who does big cat investigations, aren't you? I said, yeah. Yeah. He said, oh, I've seen you in the local paper. He said, I run a scout group. And he said, I take them to the Forester Dean camping. And he said, uh, I no longer let them sleep out in the open. They now have to be in enclosed tents. And he said, uh, at that time, wild boar hadn't really become an issue. It was just early days of wild boar, but people would do that because of wild boar now as well, I think. But he said, I'm responsible for them. They're not my kids and everything. And I just do believe in the big cat reports. And just as a very modest precaution, you know, they sleep in tents rather than wild camping. If it was very good weather, you know, they, some of them would sleep out in the stars, as it were. So there we are. There's somebody who just, without making a fuss, was making a slight tweak to the arrangements just because he felt, you know, without, probably without saying why, but that's, um, that's what he did. Yeah, so in informing the leaders that there is the potential or there is some knowledge of, but we don't know, and you might like to think about X and Y might be a, the step between here of no one acknowledging it and a couple of people who are in those kind of responsible positions taking some precautionary, proportionate steps. Yeah, yeah. Just incidentally, I mean, we heard that Eliza didn't know anything about it. Now, at the age of nine, that's not mm. surprising, I guess. Did you know there was a potential for big cats to be living wild in Britain before this happened? So I've grown up in East Anglia and have heard, as I guess lots of people around here, of the fen tiger. 
But I think that probably any images that conjures up are probably nothing to do with what <laughs> I would associate with what Eliza saw, because I guess it's not a tiger and, you know, whatever. Just for overseas listeners especially, the Fen Tiger is the way that the local media in the east of England have depicted black panthers and mountain lion type sightings. People, I think, realise it's not a tiger. It's your beast of Bodmin and Exmoor beast equivalent in the way it's dubbed in the press, isn't it, really? Yeah, it definitely. It, it feels, I suppose, to me, living in a city, it feels like rural folklore as opposed to anything I would ever stumble across or kind of think about on a day to day basis. But I, it wouldn't have been something I'd talked about. My husband is also from this area, and I suppose he's from a much more rural environment. So it may have figured a little more in his kind of local narrative, I suppose, growing up. But yeah, it's not something I think about ever until recently. Yeah. <laughs> It was that kind of shock. It was a new thing for you to consider. Yeah. We said to this to Eliza about, do you make judgments on who you might discuss it with based on how you think they might feel about it? Is it something you're cautious about bringing up in conversation or do you feel, to hell with it, I'm going to tell people because I think they ought to know? Or are you still a bit wary about bringing up in conversations? So I don't really tell a lot of people that Eliza saw one. So I've told close family and very close friends, but I, firstly, I think it's her story to tell if she wants to. And also, I think it's very easy to disregard children's stories and children's experiences. And I don't really want there to be a, I suppose, a kind of um, a feeling of disbelief around her, you know, or for her to be um, laughed at or anything. So, no, it's not something we talk about a lot, I think. As I found out more about the subject and listened to some of your podcasts and kind of looked things up, I find the subject increasingly interesting, so I probably talk about the subject now and again, but I don't necessarily relate it back to what happened to my daughter. In this question about what's your attitude to big cats naturalising in the wild of Britain, can you only think about that question in relation to a local one that's seen by your daughter, or can mm. you see it in a bigger picture way as well, that there's these big cats in our ecosystem now and we dump them there and they've randomly created their own population which seems to be living on. Have you got a view on that or is it solely, is it very much influenced by the family's experience? I think those two things operate separately. I think Eliza had this very unique experience and I think you probably heard she struggles to articulate it really and I think on the one hand she's saying it was amazing and on the other hand it was terrifying and I think that just speaks to her being young and actually not quite knowing. And also, we're quite fearless when we're little. She came home and she was still safe and nothing bad happened. That's essentially her reality. But the what-ifs are quite scary. So I think the what-ifs are quite hard to get away from, which is, you know, especially when you're not believed and especially when you then follow it, because that's what you've been told to do and you're not very powerful as a child to say, but I don't really want to. So there is that whole local experience then on another level, as I've learned a bit more, I sort of feel quite, I don't know, I suppose fairly resigned, but not resigned in a bad way. I think it seems to be just a fact. I don't think we can do much about it. And it is sort of exciting and interesting. I suppose one thing is it adds a kind of new dynamic to holidays and weekend breaks. And, you know, so we spend quite a lot of time around Suffolk, for example, or yeah, we've been on holidays to the Highlands and to the Herefordshire and Welsh borders and all those things kind of take on a bit of a new lease of life. So I think it would be extremely sad if this phenomenon stopped people enjoying outside. That would be a dreadful thing. But actually, so if it can add a kind of a frisson of excitement to families and people enjoying outside, then that's that's a positive thing. And I have mixed emotions about it, maybe because of my daughter being involved. And I think we need to work towards some sort of framework, more official framework that helps people who need to know more. Some sort of signposting. I don't know whether that's just metaphorical or something on an actual post. I don't know what it looks like. As I talk to more people, so what's been really interesting for me is kind of some of the conversations I've had with people. One or two people I've told have been quite sort of scoffing and laughed. But then it's quite funny because actually once you do at first, where people are quite, you know, take the mickey, then and as the conversation progresses, they'll say, oh, well, actually, you know, I must admit where I grew up, no, a lot of the farmers did used to talk about it, or or I knew a gamekeeper who said he'd he'd tried to shoot one. or It's almost like the, the stories that people never tell until someone mentions it. And 
another friend of mine who'd never mentioned it grew up in the Forest of Dean. She said, oh, yes, well, of course, all the old ladies used to talk about it all the time, but we never really listened to them. We're like, oh, OK, right, you know. The best one really was a friend of mine. He really laughed and kind of just dismissed it in a good natured way. And then he messaged me the next week and said, ah, I take it back. I'm really sorry. He'd, he'd been on an enormous bike ride all around the wider Fens area and then um, had been through a cornfield, you know, with really tall corn. And he said, yeah, I saw the back end of something big and black with a very long tail disappearing through it. So I'm really sorry. And I take it all back. So it's just quite interesting, I guess, having had it not in my consciousness at all. It sort of began to seep in. I'm, you know, I mentioned the kind of ideas of it to one or two people and suddenly these little anecdotes start feeding their way to you. So, yeah, it's been a kind of interesting journey. And so interesting when a sceptic sees one right on cue, as it were. It does happen sometimes and how that influences them. I was speaking to a journalist recently. She said, having looked into it, she said, I can see that people are scared of the subject. And she meant people and organisations. And, and she didn't mean scared of the animals. She meant it's just something that we deny or we evade and we're scared to face up to it. In some ways, it's why I called my book, the subtitle of my book, Facing Britain's Wild Predators. I meant facing up to the fact we've got them as well as making sure we recognise that they are there. What do you make of that comment that we're scared of the subject or people are scared of the subject? I think if we, as a country, I'm not quite sure what the we is, or as a people or as a community, if we do face up to it, then people are expected to do a thing, to have an action in acknowledging something. I suppose our society expects there to be next steps and official stuff. And actually, what you talk about more, which is more of a scientific approach, finding out more, understanding them. I don't know, what, what would be your kind of North Star in terms of what to achieve? But I guess, wouldn't it be amazing to kind of tag one, I guess, and know what their life was like? You know, when you watch these programmes about domestic cats and you kind of fix a camera on them and you realise they don't just go next door, they go to the next town or something and steal different dinners. It would obviously be great to know more because that would only inform how we can respond as a, as a society to it in a responsible way. But I don't think we have the chance to deal with it. There's a call to action. That's empty, isn't it, I think? Any kind of mobilisations in the past that have tried to confront it haven't really done that or dealt with it or, or been the answer. So it needs to be something a bit more nuanced and subtle, and that's not very headline-worthy. So I'm not quite sure where you go with that, but I think, yeah, acknowledgement leads to you know, answers, and there isn't a simple one. That's why I always say learning about them first and recognising that there are some here is the first step. And then from there, you know, that informs whatever you might do, how you communicate it and how you give guidance on it. And you know, I'm very much with you that you sort of cautiously and slowly just start learning more and more and that awareness can spread from that. The learning can be interesting. It doesn't have to be scary and doesn't have to be mm -hmm. ominous sort of thing. It is, I think. And um, one thing that struck me, I think, as I've listened to some of the, the conversations on your podcast is I've been overwhelmed by how positive people respond to some situations which were really quite scary. And I think there's one or two involving young people or involving people walking by themselves. And they're quite serious situations. And I think, well, a, it's amazingly brave and fantastic that people come and talk to it. And I guess that's almost quite therapeutic in a way to kind of tell your story to people who are interested in and believe it and help you manage it. But I've been surprised by the complete lack of a kind of we must do something about this type reaction. Because it doesn't sit comfortably with us as people in our, our safe island home. You know, it doesn't sit comfortably with people who we don't really, we're not brought up with any real, especially in city people like me, we're not brought up with any sense at all of reading the landscape or or kind of reading what the other wildlife are doing and trying to interpret our environment. I try and take my family as much as possible to the countryside and, you know, in interesting sort of scrubby areas where things aren't quite as safe as cities, you know, but we have none of that. We have none of that kind of inherited knowledge or wisdom. It is a bit scary and it is a bit daunting and we shouldn't really have to wait till something horrendous happens to really confront it and be a bit grown up about it. And I think that sort of smiling and hoping for the best maybe won't always be enough. But I've been overwhelmed by the courage of the people who've spoken to you, been through this, this kind of 
really challenging situation where they've feared for themselves or feared for their pets or or have had their beloved horses attacked or whatever it is. And they're still think, oh, no, fair enough. You know, you take your space. I'll take mine. Anyway, I think it's amazing, really, that people are so generous in spirit. I constantly find this and I find most people take a middle ground approach. You know, they're not complacent, but they're not hysterical and paranoid and over the top and alarmist. Yeah. And they think just got to be measured. And I think maybe even if they were scared and felt it could have been a very risky situation, I think they reflect on it and think, well, hang on. It's not like it's routinely reported that we've got these animals wanting to ambush us and terrorise us and ruin our lives. I think they are reflecting that coexistence can happen. But I think it's perhaps why some people are sceptical, because for them it's abstract and they think, oh, well, there would be problems if we had big carnivores like this. But for people who've had it for real, they realise that actually they may be intimidating animals that could easily win a battle with us, but they choose not to largely because they want an easy life and they've got a stress-free life anyway. So it's when it's for real, people understand, you know, that dynamic. And when it's not real and it's abstract, I think people think we're heading for trouble. It could be scary, but it's mostly not like that. And especially if it's people who know their land and know their area. When you listen to people with farmers and people who can read the environment around them, I think they can probably fit it in with that, which I guess is brilliant and why they can take such a, a kind of generous approach to it. Yeah, and luckily most of them that I experience anyway put it in perspective and feel that they really aren't getting much of an impact. But a few are, and I think it would be very nice to try and give them better advice and support. The odd few people who are suffering more than others, I think it would be nice to support them in some way. Yeah, exactly. Working towards more understanding and more information, a more scientific framework that could then be used to help to brief and inform people who are in a position to mitigate the risk effectively. But I think that we should probably be honest about the fact there are probably some areas in the UK that you would say are probably not ideal for an under the stars cub camp, for example. But I don't know if the right people know that. <laughs> That's right. There's some bottom line guidance, basically. Then the trouble is, if you start saying that, you risk sounding like too alarmist. But by talking about it, we might start getting towards it. And it sounds like there's a groundswell of knowledge about it anyway. And actually, there's no real denial from anywhere. There's just not a, an acknowledgement of it. So yeah, by default, I guess it will just carry on being known. Also, you can go to places which are real hotspots for sightings and reports. But in those places, you can still meet people who are adamant that it must be mass delusion and there aren't any mm -hmm. and they don't believe what their neighbours and friends and others are saying. Because I think some people just take a position. They're not open-minded and they won't have it that other people consistently report the same thing. So, But then at least you're doing your duty in saying, well, and we've had this on the podcast, you know, people going around telling their neighbours because their neighbours have got children. Mm. The um, two women in Lincolnshire did this because they lived in remote part of Lincolnshire, told the neighbours to be you know, cautious and that what they'd seen. And yeah. they said most of their neighbours didn't thank them, just said, don't be so stupid. But at least they did their sense of duty, as it were. Yeah, that feels like a really responsible next step. You can't buckle up someone's seatbelt for them, but you can certainly you know, advocate the wearing of seatbelts, can't you? And I think then you've taken a responsible step. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we always like to try and put something on the website to correspond with uh, each edition. And something we're going to put on the website for this episode is this book that's come out in Melbourne, in Australia, because they have Big Cat sightings there as well. And it's just called Big Cat, and it's by an author and illustrator, Jess Ratcliffe. And lovely little simple book about this young girl who goes exploring, reads about big cat stories in the wild in Australia and decides she's going to go out on the edge of Melbourne where she lives with her binoculars and start tracking and, and get into the adventure of looking for big cat signs and gets interesting at the end <laughs> when it becomes a bit real. And the real message of that book is that it really helps her awareness of uh, the outdoors and even city life. You know, she starts seeing things and noticing things and becoming 
just more alert to life. So it's got a very good positive message. Kids up to about seven. It's a great little book and that deserves support. So we'll put it on the website. That's Big Cat by Jess Ratcliffe. Before we hand back to Eliza and just quickly say, is there any final thoughts from her? Anything else you would like to say, Sarah? I suppose just reflecting again. So I still think that Eliza and I are kind of, you know, we don't talk about it for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then we do talk about it. And I think we're still learning. I think it's been quite interesting. You know, we've learned quite a lot of stuff about a whole new subject. We've looked at some really lovely pictures online. We're already big cat fans anyway, but well, I mean, big fans of little cats, but now we're increasingly interested in the bigger ones. So I was just thinking really then, overall, would I say it's been a positive or a negative thing? And whilst, of course, everything is a bit of everything, I would say on balance, it has added to our lives. She does feel a little bit special, I suppose, that this interesting thing happened. Her and her friend at school, the girl she was with at the time and and the boy just behind them, yeah, the three of them have this kind of interesting little thing that happened that they don't really tell anyone about but it's just like like a little a bit of a knowledge you know a bit of a nod to one another which is kind of feels all right it's added in a way to our exploring of the world around us but I do think in the back of my mind and certainly in the back of her mind there is a bit more trepidation about what's around that gorse bush or I don't know would she do as much hide and seek in the woods I'm not quite sure, you know, so I don't know. It will play out, I guess, because she's still only little. It will play out. But I don't think it's a big, serious thing that in any way has changed the direction of her life, other than she's just as interested in in the world and science and, and outdoors, really. It's made you think about mild precautions in certain situations. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think it brings a real respect for our environment. And I think that is, on balance, a really good thing. Well, thank you for helping bring the subject of the young person's perspective into the podcast agenda. When we got to the 100th episode, I was thinking, what kinds of people haven't we heard from yet on the podcast? It's always fishermen. We want to hear from more fishermen and that sort of people. But we've, we've had a fisherman now with um, Wayne last time. We've now heard from a, a young person, which is lovely. And I hope we can hear from some more in the future. We all benefit from that, and I'm sure the listeners really appreciate that family judgment that you would come on and talk about it. Well, thank you so much for for listening to us and very simply for believing her, and I think just for the support, really, because I think when we reached out to you, you were very helpful in setting it in a context for us, so that was really appreciated by both me and Eliza. Well, great, because I learn from every example, and the podcast does as well. So, as I say, we're all in it together, so it's nice that we can all chat it through together. So thank you for that. If Eliza's there, I know it's nearly my bedtime, let alone Eliza's bedtime. Eliza, do you want to pop back, darling? Hi, Eliza. Well, we had just had a long chat with your mum, Sarah, there about all the other aspects about whether we should put signs up and have guidance for cub groups and, and scout groups and people doing outdoor activities. It's difficult, isn't it? I'm just more aware that there's, there's big cats out there in the wild, like not in zoos or wildlife parks. Have you been trying to go and see a black leopard in a zoo or will you try and look out to to do one or you take an interest in big cats when you go to zoos yeah i have taken more interest in them some of the animals that i've become quite intrigued with and want to learn more about them good stuff yeah Yeah. well i think you've been a star eliza i think all the listeners of the podcast will be so grateful that you came on to talk about this yeah i know you probably found it nervous a lot of the adult guests say they found it nervous, but thank you ever so much for doing it. And really good of you to come on Big Cat Conversations. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Should I just say goodbye? Hello, right on cue, Dennis has just come in with a big loud purr and his tail up for dinner. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, one thing that I didn't say... Yeah, go on. ...is just to make it clear, I think, that this park where it happened is actually somewhere where we always go and quite regularly, as do hundreds and thousands of families around here, to, to play on the park. So it's, you know, there's two massive areas with swings and there's people use boats and canoes and paddle boards on the lakes. And it's a place that's used enormously by families. And I think, yeah, this isn't kind of an, an out of the way, empty scrubland. This is a kind of in the day, it's chock-a-block with dog walkers and families and, and young people enjoying it. And it's literally backed by houses. So this is it's not quite in the city, but it's just on the outskirts between this city and a neighbouring village. It is right there amongst us, which I think is partly why the whole context of it 
feels quite odd because it's surrounded by supermarkets. <laughs> At night time, it would be pretty quiet and silent, would it, do you think? Yeah, definitely. The, I mean, the car park would be shut. I guess that's why the Cubs just have access. We drop them off and they go in on access by foot. So, yeah, it's certainly not used at all at night, yeah. Yeah. It would it be a place with rabbits and pigeons and uh, water birds, would it? And perhaps even deer? Um, all of those things. In fact, we get deer in town. My daughter has spotted them in her own playground. So I think, yeah, I mean, that's that kind of goes without saying that it would be, I think, yeah, ducks, swans, there's geese there, there's loads of fish yeah a lot of people fishing there yeah there would be rabbits i mean there would be all sorts that you would get in any country type setting but it's just that it is literally on the edge of this big city so yeah well i can honestly think of equivalent sightings and reports uh, that are credible in similar places in gloucester urban fringe city fringe sightings where you Mm. think gosh you know in certain times of day that's a busy place you know fancy a cat going there but maybe night time and I've had one in a supermarket car park on the edge of Gloucester as well. It was on, yeah. on the edge of town. A 24-hour supermarket. Somebody saw one in the edge of the car park at night time. And have you had similar experiences of groups of children with head torches in that kind of scenario? Yes, I have. I was going to actually say about, I think one of the possibilities is the high-pitched tone of kids, actually. So if that was happening, do you think, in Eliza's group? So I think it was very hard for her to kind of explain, I don't know, kind of be empathetic about what a cat might be thinking. Yeah, that's kind of a really difficult ask. But I think from what she explained to me, it sounded like the cat would have been more than aware they were there. You know, it was a few metres and there was this group of children and cub leaders, you know, being encouraged to be, you know, to kind of own the environment. So, I mean, they were loud, they weren't creeping about. So I suspect it was a curiosity thing because Eliza and her two friends were out ahead of the pack. And I think, you know, whilst it didn't display any kind of threatening behaviour, we don't know what would have happened had she not been fairly quickly caught up by the rest of the pack and by bigger adults with bigger torches or and suddenly what was kind of three small people with small voices suddenly became a kind of large pack of bright lights, I suppose. So so I suspect it was curiosity slash is this of interest to me in a more scary way, quickly replaced by nah, can't be bothered. There was kind of nothing really dramatic about it other than It was a leopard in front of my daughter. (laughs) Close, fairly close, yes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Certainly on the podcast, actually, Peter Taylor in, uh, I can't remember what episode it was, it's called Secret Links, and we actually did a YouTube filming of it, and he had his son playing with head torches in a wood in the Forest of Dean when they were camping, and he'd heard it outside his tent the night before, forgot to tell the kids when they went to play the next day, (laughs) because he meant to tell them to be cautious. But that evening, they came racing out of the nearby woodland and got uh, almost impaled on the barbed wire, frantically climbing over the fence and saying there was a big black cat with yellow-green eyes, curiously watching them. But they would have been shouting and high-pitched and with head torches. They're very nonchalant, aren't they, about it? Gosh. Yeah. One other one in Gloucestershire, actually, and this um, young lad mentioned it in a school and the head teacher phoned up afterwards to because he obviously heard that it got reported and Mm. his view was that that boy should not be believed because yeah he Mm. just uh, yeah and so what do you make of that i make of it that i think actually the boy could have been telling the truth and the teacher just wanted to shrug it off as difficult as it is is, i do accept it's difficult it is but then there is there is a safeguarding responsibility you know, a responsible adult for a group of children, even if inside you're saying no, you have to say, wow, okay, do the right thing by the child. So no disrespect again to these volunteers. But I think someone tells you there's something quite dangerous over there. I'm not sure what it was, but I'm scared. You avert and you do something different. There is a responsibility to act as if you believe. I think in that particular case of the follow up call, it was about in case it got out. Mm. through the big cat investigators that a child at this school had reported one in the grounds adjacent to the school that it would hit the school's reputation with sensitive people and can make the judgments not to spread the word in an alarmist way but maybe that teacher was just 
protecting the reputation of the school. But as you say, there's a safeguarding issue as well. Again, these are difficult judgments. Always the issue of young children prone not to be believed anyway, but uh, I would say young children have less baggage than us adults. I guess it's just a sad reality that people don't always say, wow, tell me more, which is what you've done today, which is great. Thank you so much then, Sarah. So good. And thank Eliza again for us. And she's been a star of the show, as you know. I will do. Thank you. Thank you.